board. We have the tone for burn cutoff on Delta B. Roger, go move, Juno. Juno, welcome to Jupiter. That was a very excited NASA mission control celebrating after receiving a radio signal from the Juno spacecraft, confirming that Juno had reached Jupiter's orbit. It took five years to make the 1.8 billion mile trip. It is the first ship to travel that far using solar power. And for more on this mission, we're joined by Mark Taylor. Mark is the manager of the planetarium and science programs at the Hudson River Museum. Welcome back to the program, Mark. Happy to be here again. So, uh, we're, we're, Juno's mission is to learn more about Jupiter, but what specifically are we trying to learn that we don't know already? Well, one of the things that maybe people might remember from school is that Jupiter is sort of a gaseous planet with liquid inside that with a solid core. And actually, we don't really know that. We think that it has a solid core, but we're not sure. We think that it has a thick layer of liquid metallic hydrogen, super compressed hydrogen underneath its layer of gas on the outside. And from what we know about matter, the way it acts under high pressure, yeah, it should be. But we don't actually know the details about Jupiter's interior. And most of the spacecraft we've sent by Jupiter have been at a good distance, so we haven't been able to take measurements from very close up. We dropped one probe into the atmosphere. It missed most of the clouds in the areas that had water. So we wanted to send something there to learn more about the water content of the planet itself. And we'll be able to tell that from Juno, both orbiting Jupiter and then also at some point it's going to, cr it's going to crash into the planet. Well, the crashing into the planet, burning up in the atmosphere, that's done to keep any of Jupiter's moons from being contaminated. It is impossible basically to sterilize a spacecraft completely. And it would be a shame if it were to hit, say, Jupiter's moon Europa. If we then send a mission to Europa, what we end up discovering when we get there is something that some technician sneezed on the spaceship. So we really do the study as we're orbiting the planet remotely. And Europa is one of the places in the solar system where we think there might be the possibility for at least the ingredients for life? Yeah, well, the ingredients for life and the conditions overall are just about as good as you could get off the Earth. Mm -hmm. There's a source of energy. The interior of Europa is heated by the gravitational flexing. The insides are rubbed together. Um, also, there's lots of liquid water, and there's lots of minerals there, too. There's organic material, so seems like a good place for life to possibly be. Back to Jupiter, the planet itself, we still really don't know that much about the, the, the Great Red Spot, which I think is shrinking, is it not? It has been shrinking for the past few years. That's not unusual. I mean, it tends to change size over time. But we don't know whether or not it's going to keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until it disappears. There is now a small red spot, which has appeared, and maybe what happens cyclically over time is that the large red spot gets smaller, another red spot takes over, maybe there's always one red spot at one time or another. We, we don't know. But that's one of the things that we hope to learn by learning more about the interior structure of Jupiter, the flow of energy, things like that. It's, a, it's amazing to me because Jupiter is a visible planet. You can see it with the naked eye in the sky, and yet there's still so much that we don't know about the largest planet in our solar system. Yeah, well, the very fact that it's large means that even if you know something about what it looks like from the outside, you know about this much of it. And there's all this toward the core, which you can't directly study. Is there, so what can we learn then about ourselves through this study? Can, do we get a sense of how the, the solar system began and, and by extension learning about the formation of the Earth? Yes, because Jupiter grew to such a very large size, much larger than all the other planets, all the other planets put together about the same size and not as massive we think that Jupiter formed first. So what Jupiter is made of, its composition, probably is the closest that we would be able to get to the original composition of all the dust and gas that formed the solar system itself. How much, and this may be impossible to answer, but how much of the focus on, on planetary exploration like this mission to Jupiter is focused on learning more about ourselves and how much is just sort of the greater quest for scientific knowledge and learning about the, the solar system and the universe in general? Well, one way to think about it is that because we are part of the universe, if we learn about the rest of the universe, we're always learning about ourselves. Um, but there are some extremely you know, wonky and nerdy things that scientists want to know as well, which might not have any immediate bearing on life on Earth or understanding of our own origins or ourselves. But they're things which help us understand the universe overall in a great more detail. And they raise new questions so that we know where to look next time in order to learn more. If, if you could just get the answer to, let's say, one or two overall questions about the solar system uh, or, or things that we don't know yet, what would you like to know the answer to? Um, one thing which I would like to know because it's very difficult to model is exactly what happened when the giant planets were forming. Because we know, for example, that 
Jupiter and maybe Saturn formed closer to the sun. We know that Uranus and Neptune, the size that they are, they couldn't have formed as far away as they are. So we think what happened is that the giant planets formed close to the sun, they migrated far away. Jupiter and Saturn may have switched places, but we don't really know. It, it's very difficult to simulate how that might have worked and to narrow it down to just one possibility. And, and finally, Mark, I, you're obviously a guy who loves space exploration, and, mm -hmm. and I've Ever since I was a kid, I have too. But it seems like the, the romance of space and space exploration seems to be waning a bit with the general public. The, you know, we're not doing the space shuttle programs anymore and not knowing what the next big mission is. It, is this a way to sort of reignite that romance about space, especially when it comes to kids sort of finding new worlds to explore? Okay. Well, as far as romance, a lot of times people like to compare things to the 60s. And in the 60s, it was constant. Every few months, there was a mission, there was a discovery, there was either we launching, th there was us launching things, or there was the Soviets launching things, then we had to respond. Um, you know, these days, it's not this constant adventure, this, you know, constant ongoing battle. Um, it's something which is ongoing, and every single time there's a mission, there's a lot of interest in it. And we'll be getting results from Juno for years now. Mark Taylor, manager of the Planetarium and Science Programs of the Hudson River Museum, thank you so much for a few minutes. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll take a quick break on RFL. Up next, our Hudson Valley headlines.